All right, thank you so much for what's on your mind. Katrina Jefferson. Right now, brothers and sisters, you know it's Saturday, so our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson, is in the house. Oh, Lord, my God, when I'm in awesome wonder, Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power flew out the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings Director, Minister Tyrone Richardson, accompanied by Chris Garland. Right now, brothers and sisters, you know, since last year, the world has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this morning, we're pleased to have Bishop Mitchell Taylor with us. He's co-founder and CEO of Urban Upbound with a special report on the impact of COVID-19 in public Housing. Let's welcome Bishop Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. It's a pleasure to be here on this morning with my family at the National Action Network. I am the economic development arm for the National Action Network in Long Island City, Harlem, Far Rockaway, and Queens. And I greet you on this morning. Let's give our dear Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton a big hand on this morning. Uh, to Dr. Hardy, to Dom Dominique, I see Reverend English, and to Crystal, who has an awesome body of film work, and to Rodney, and to, I see Eric Cooper, the Queensbridge family, Queensbridge in the house on today. Quick report, as you know, 12 months ago or so, we were plunged into this pandemic, and isolation hit us all, and we had to move into action quickly. So Urban Upbound opened up a 10,000 square foot warehouse right in the heart of Long Island City, and we began serving up to 250,000 pounds of food from Northwestern Queens all the way to Far Rockaway, including East Harlem. And uh, we did this because we realized that our populations would be plunged into a food insecure situation. And we wanted to make sure that that, that did not happen. And so we were able to do that successfully. Trucks were running Monday through Saturday, delivering all over the city of New York on behalf of our people. Now, I want to say this, I'm almost done. Uh, in the 26th council district where I'm from, I grew up in Queensbridge houses, and I'm privileged to have walked the halls of public housing and walked the halls of Park Avenue at the same time. And uh, when I go to places and people ask me, well, what is your academic pedigree? I say, well, I've got a bachelor, I've got a master's, but I also have a PhD. And they say, well, where'd you get that from? I said, I have a public housing degree. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me, because some of y'all got that same degree. Now, in the 26th council district in Long Island City, from the community board all the way to Congress, there has never been a representative of color representing our people. Never in 150 years, never has there been a representative of color. For the first time in history, 
we have an exciting African-American woman that is running for city council in Long Island City. And I wanted to sneak her in on today. I hope Rev don't get mad at me, but she's exciting and I wanted you to meet her and I want to give her my time on this morning. And I promise you, I'll talk to each and every one of you after this service. I got masks and other things that I want to give to you and talk to you about. But help me welcome for the first time to the National Action Network stage, Ebony Young, Young for Queens. Bishop is the action. So three things. The time is now. Everybody plays a role. And my question to you is, how are you sustaining the movement? The Reverend Doctor can't do this by himself. He needs each and every one of us to participate in making sure that black people have a seat at the table. And by the way, we're no longer taking seats. We're demanding them. And so we are coming to the table in demand of the black movement, of the people of color movement at six years old. At six years old, I saw the Ku Klux Klan burn a cross in our yard while moving to a predominantly white neighborhood. Bullets shot through our window three inches from my brother's head because I wanted to play with a little white girl across the fence in the 80s. In the 1980s, my father being a minister grabbed me to the side and said, don't you ever allow a person to dictate what you do and how you think you take the role of leadership and make the change. And so today, I am running as the first African-American woman in Queens District 26 with the support of Bishop Mitchell Taylor. And we will take this community by storm. And I promise you that I will represent black people to the fullest and demand the seat at the table. Thank you so much for your time today. All right, thank you. And thank you, Bishop Taylor, for sharing. They're on the move in District 26. Right now, we are so pleased to have with us this morning the Reverend Dr. Q English. He's the senior pastor of the Bronx Christian Fellowship Church in the great borough of the Bronx. Let's welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, morning, afternoon. So glad to be here at NAD. It makes me feel like I want to just take a selfie or something. You know, um, I do give honor to one of the great leaders of our nation. Can we put it up for Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton? So yes, we're here with an, uh, another Women History Month. I always say that if uh, you allow us just a few moments in the room, women will be able to change the world. Now I'm going to go right into the scriptures of cognizant of time. Um, I want to look at a particular character in Judges, the 19th chapter. She's simply referred to as concubine, the concubine from Bethlehem, Judah. No other name given, but no other name needed, for indeed this concubine's encounter represents so many of us in our world. Her husband was called the Levite, uh, a certain Levite, and he too needed no other name, for indeed he represents so many of us in our world. The story begins by letting us know she had violated her vows and left her husband and had been staying with her father for about four months. I guess at that time the husband felt it was time for her to come back home, so he pursued her and found her at her father's house. Now the story moves on to the time when the Levite was ready to go home. He gets weary on the long journey, which is understandable, and his servant recommended that they stop and rest at a certain place. And he said, no, we need to keep it moving because this is a strange land. He said, we must go to where we are familiar, to those that are part of our family, to those that are part of our community, because surely in our own community we can be safe. They continued their journey until they reached Gilead, on, and it was a relief, because there was familiarity. My brothers and my sisters, this is my community. This is where I should be able to be and be safe. They waited in the square, however, and no one came 
to their rescue. No one stopped to ask, how may I help you? Or do you need to eat something? Until finally they saw the gentleman look on them and said, hey, you can come to my house. And then while they were dining and being married, there was a drastic turn of events. Drastic. One that you can't even prepare for. There was a knock at the door of men asking the owner of the house to give them the Levite, the male, so that they can have their way with them. And the owner of the house said, that's vile to ask for the man. Have my daughter and concubine instead and do with them what seemeth good unto you. So it was vile for the man, yet it was acceptable for the woman. Oh, how true of a picture the story paints of how women are looked at and treated in many places throughout our world. And that's why we got to think about how, who we choose, who we want to lead our cities. Because today in New York City, there are candidates, mayoral and DA candidates, pushing for the legalization and decriminalization of prostitution right here. And I'm going to tell you right now that it will be on the backs of our black and brown. They say that decriminalization will make it safer for those in the sex trade. Not true. Because in every country that has either decriminalized or legalized prostitution, violence has increased. Every country has seen an increase in violence, a decrease in the age of trafficked victims, and an increase in human trafficking in general. These women that we're looking at need services and resources, but is this what we want for our city, for our country, where legal brothels are in your neighborhoods? frequented by European males. Is that what you want to provide prostitution as a viable job for our children to think that being prostituted is a job that has a clear career path? Not recognizing that study shows that mortality rates for prostituted women are 40 to 50 times the national average. That's why you better know who stands for what. When you go to that valley, you better know who stands for what issues. And there's only two candidates in New York who stands against the legalization or decriminalization of prostitution, and they are Eric Adams and Ray McGuire. Anyone else will bring this city? Anyone else will bring this city into an even darker place, which will eventually lead to our state becoming the next pimp state where pimps will own brothels and continue the dark trade of human trafficking. Not on my watch. Not my daughters, not my sons. And at the end of the day, we have to recognize that the city is in an economic crisis, and this is not the answer. Economics is foundational. Economics is foundation to everything from, from crime to education. So if the candidates are not talking about the how we're going to come out of this economic crisis, then more than likely they don't know how to get us there. We need a strong economic agenda for this generation and the next. So remember who you vote for when you walk into that, into that box. Remember what this city will look like. So as we look back at this story, the Bible says they knew her, this woman, that they just gave the concubine to the men who asked and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where the Lord was till it was light. She, she was lying at the door of his, I mean his house, I mean our community, I mean his house, I mean our neighborhood, lying there. And as drastic as this was, I believe what took place next was even more drastic. The Bible said, and her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was falling down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said to her, get up, get up. Of all the things that the story painted, these two words were equally disturbing. Not how are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? I feel your pain, I, I empathize with you, but get up. A woman who has gone through what she had to go through, the entire night of abuse, total mental anguish, and the first thing you're going to tell me is to get up. It is so common 
today for us to not understand how deep the pain of so many of us are going through that sometimes we torn, turn cold and indifferent because of the things we ourselves are dealing with, I understand, but my brothers and sisters, we do not have a right to tell our brothers and sisters when it's time to get up. We do not have a right to determine the expiration date of their trauma. Yeah. You don't have a right to tell me to get up. You don't have a right to put an expiration date of my trauma. But what you can do, you can come down to where I am. You can get in the dirt with me. You can crawl with me. But you don't have the right to tell me yeah. to get up. I need you to love me where I am. I need you to love me back to life. Our children, our children need us to love them where they are. And I need you to walk with me. And I know I'm not perfect, but I need you to walk with me. And at times, I know it's God's footprints in the sand that is carrying me until I am able to walk on my own. But I just need you to see me. My brothers and sisters, we need to be the community who restores neighbor back into our hoods. We need to be the village that once again raises her children. No longer can we live by the mantra what goes on in the house stays in the house, which has destroyed many of families I know that firsthand growing up in Carver projects. Loving my bacalaitos and los capoyas and my 10 cent sugar cane. But I understand the things that goes on in the house have to stay in the house. Me, myself, being a victim, and the only thing we did was ate my food, and I stood up and had to go to school the next day, never able to process. What goes on in the house stays in the house. would have been one of the most dangerous things we have lived by. That's why we have found even my own household, my drug addicts, my, 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 my alcoholics, my crack addicts, my brother dying from HIV AIDS. Why? Because what goes on in the house stays in the house. Our things must come out of the house to get the mental health care that we so desperately need. And let me end by encouraging as I obey the time that has been allotted me. Let me encourage those who are listening today. What you've done or what has happened to you does not define who you are. You are not what they say and who they say you are. No man controls your destiny. And this is not how your story ends. God said, I have called you by a new name. The mouth of the Lord has declared it. God bless you. Brothers and sisters, the Tay John Sambo.
accompanied by Chris Garland. Right now, brothers and sisters, I want you to get on your feet at home. Put your hands together for the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the Village of Harlem. And for you that are listening live on 1190 WLIB AM in New York, you that are watching us around the country on nationalactionnetwork.net and we'll be on shortly on Impact Television, we are happy to be here to give you another week report on where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. And our musical director, the Reverend Minister Tyrone Richardson. Certainly we are happy giving, giving a salute to our women. Nash Action Network is uh, 30 years old this month. And every year of our existence, we recognized and worked with Women's History Month. But in the movement, every month is Women's History Month. But I want to thank uh, the Women's Auxiliary of the New York Chapter and uh, Sister Lisa Hobbs, who's now the president of the Auxiliary this uh, term. We call her Goldie. And, and I must say, we are talking about women. We honor, of course, every week she's with us, Gwen Carr, the mother of Eric Garner. 
And uh, we, uh, I must say today as we sat and listened, this has been one of the most substantive uh, women auxiliary speaking. Uh, first, uh, Gwen and I didn't come in because my friend Crystal McCrary was speaking. And she was, they said, she, Gwen said she called and told she was nervous. And that maybe she'd be more nervous as we was out here. So we was listening on the radio in the back. And she cranked up and did a great job. I thought she was going to preach. I talking about a birth certificate unknown. I thought she was getting ready to preach. And uh, Crystal was good. And, and, and you do not know, not only for those here, but in Radio Land, how many young women need to hear a woman that they watch her films and read her books talk about where her roots come from. Because they need to know they're not the only ones that were born under circumstances that we used to hide but now we can deal with in pride. You don't need to hide where you come from. First of all, you didn't choose where you come from. So nothing to hide because you didn't do it, it was done to you. But the story is the glory that you came from that and made it through anyhow. And Crystal is an accomplished writer and film producer and is the wife of one of the leading candidates for mayor of New York, Ray McGuire. So I want her to know she did a great job, and uh, her and, uh, uh, and Gwen was talking about she called her, Rachel Nolan was talking about she called her, but she don't need to write a call, just turn on the mic, Crystal know. Now I know she's not talking private, because she will tell you what's got to be said, but she did a public speech today. Give her a hand, Crystal McCoy. I might say Crystal McCoy or McGuire. Now, since we, uh, and then my, my Bishop Taylor came and gave us some of the he's going to do more, but then so I heard him talking about he slipped in Sister Young. And I looked at uh, Gwen Carr and said, oh, he slipped in a candidate. I got to call our general counsel. But then our general counsel sitting out here helping him slip her in. <laughs> he part of the slip, so give a hand, Bishop Taylor and Sister Young. In the 26th district. I want Sister Young to know I'm you running, but we already got one elected, and that's the mayor of Queensbridge houses here every week, Rodney Jones. That's I, we elected him the mayor of Queensbridge House. But then let me say that we have had every week we do inspirational speakers. We've had none better, more substantive, more on the issues and more courageous than our own speaker this morning. I've known her, I've watched her, Reverend Dr. Q, English is the real deal. And she and I served together on a group called CURL, the uh, Conference of Religious Leaders. And we meet uh, uh, every quarter at the Cardinal's house and let me tell you something. There's no one that is prophetic that keeps you comfortable. Being prophetic is to make you uncomfortable. A lot of our preachers are there to entertain you and to pray to your comfort. Those that are proper, then between a prophet and an entertainer, those that are prophetic makes you deal with things you don't want to deal with. Every prophet in the Bible came to wake folk up. Well, the interpretation of that is that they had to be asleep in order to have to be awoken. If they wasn't asleep, they wouldn't need nobody to wake them up. The art of sleeping is that you are relaxed and comfortable. 
So to wake folk up is to break their comfort. And Q English comes in that tradition where churches wanted to ignore sex trafficking and other things in this city and nation. She spoke loud, cried loud, and spared not. We're honored to have her with us today. Give a big hand to Reverend Dr. Q English. And I want you to know in the privacy of the Cardinals of our home, she's just as vociferous and vehement about these issues as she is as she speaks from her own pulpit at Bronx Christian Fellowship. And that's the kind of folk I respect. And I'm glad that the, the Women's Auxiliary chose her. Let me quickly uh, say one of the things I did this week, and I'm going to get into more. Uh, was I was honored to speak for the Thurgood Marshall School this week by Zoom. And, and one of our uh, huddle members, uh, Lamine Cone, uh, was uh, the one that arranged it. And some of our young people are there. I want to congratulate uh, Lamine and all of the youngsters that graduated at Thurgood Marshall. But I also have a personal note. This week, my daughter, Dominique Sharpton Bright, uh, got her BA degree from the University of Massachusetts. She got her degree in interdisciplinary uh, studies from UMass, and she graduated Come Lord, I told her. I, I told her, Talit, her daddy came through. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> if Bishop Taylor can have a PhD, I can have a thank you, Lord degree. <laughs> but we make children that come, Lord. I didn't want to ask her what come Lord meant, but she got it, so let's welcome our family watching from Impact Television. I told uh, my grandson, Marcus Al, his mother graduated, got a BA for come Lord, and he just looked at me and said, where's my bottle? He's not impressed at all. Come, Lord, to him is come bring me my milk. <laughs> we faced this week many issues that I think we need to be very clear about. We are days away from jury selection in the trial of Derek Chabon, the officer that killed George Floyd in Minneapolis. So leading into this this week, we're dealing with the COVID-19 relief package. Now, President Biden had recommended a $1.9 trillion relief package. It is being opposed by many in the Republican side of the aisle. Now, what, what is interesting to me about that is that they gave a tax break to the wealthy that cost about as much. They would rather give a tax break to the wealthy than to give aid to people that suffer being the loss of jobs, the loss of small businesses, and other matters like that. They don't want to relieve them for a pandemic that had their president dealt with more responsibly and listened to the health experts. They would not have been in the need for this in the first place. So let, let's remember now this was not a self-inflicted wound on citizens. Not that we went out doing nothing. 
This was something that came into this country, was warned about, and despite the health experts telling Donald Trump last January that there was a pending problem that could reach pandemic proportions, he went out and misled the American people. You don't have to take my word for it. He admitted it on tape to Bob Woodward for Bob Woodward's book that he didn't want to scare the people. What he didn't want is he didn't want people to feel that things were not as rosy as he proposed they were under his presidency. Let me tell you something. When, when, uh, when uh, Q. English was talking about things left in the house, there is a strange habit people have of trying to act like because you make things look good that things are good. That's right. That's right. You must always, I don't care if it's your house, your job, or the community, you must always deal honestly with the issues at hand because things are not going to solve themselves. We've been uh, spending a lot of time this week, Lloyd Williams, chair of the uh, Uptown Chamber of Commerce, stand up, Lloyd's in the house this morning. <laughs> We've been spending a lot of time this week dealing with the issue of black communications. This radio station we're on on Saturday mornings, the black uh, newspapers, black magazines, all are being challenged in terms of advertisement and ownership, was a time when I was growing up that we would on Wednesdays get Jet Magazine and Thursdays Amsterdam News and the New York Beacon. You used to have a, a paper in uh, Brooklyn, uh, starting Brooklyn, Big Red. Some of y'all know y'all should get your numbers out of the back of Big Red. I can tell those because they said amen when I said Big Red. All of that has been either gone, WWRF, either gone or marginalized. Which means that you lose your voice. Think about that now. Monthly, we used to have Ebony, Essence, Black Enterprise, Sephia, all of them, Black Stars. Now they're down to two or three. So he and I have been wrestling with that. Some of our Blacks in power or that are in the levels of advertising ability don't want to talk about it. We have no choice but to talk about it because you, if you have no voice, you can't affect your situation. Seemed to me when Preston Sutton and others organized Bishop Taylor to own LIB and own WBLS. And because we own the radio stations, just like Bishop Jackson owns Impact TV that's on all over the world we own. When you own that, you can then deal with your economic and political interest. If we didn't have a BLS, LIB, and RL in the late 80s, David Dinkins would have never been elected mayor. So here we are, Crystal, in the 21st century, in New York City, and don't own black radio station. Today, with all of the artists doing all of the social media flashing about what they own. They do not invest in the communications industry that keeps our people informed and is the basis of them putting their careers and making commercial value. Because let me tell you something, people talk about what Reverend Al, we 
Well, you know, people don't just use radio, though, but they use social media. They are regulating social media. They're going to use the coming down with new guidelines based on what the right wing did. That you ain't going to be able to depend on social media but for so long to do so much. First of all, let me, let me give y'all a little update on that. I didn't intend to go this way, but I'm going here. The reason why social media alone I'm not against social media. I do Instagram and, and Twitter and everything else. But the reason why social media alone cannot be the mobilizer for our community is our community disproportionately is in broadband deserts. You can't go online if you can't connect. You get certain housing developments. I heard two or three housing development graduates up here this morning. You get some housing developments in New York. I'm talking about March 6, 2021, and you can't get online because you can't get in line. I'm talking about right now, down the block. So if you want to organize people from social media, how you go organize them if they can't go online and hear you? How do I know that? In the middle of this pandemic, when they closed the schools and they said young folk can go online and learn from home. Many in our community, Lord, our kids couldn't go online because they don't have access to the internet. That's why. We need social media and radio and black newspapers and black magazines. That's why I do radio every day. My show on MSNBC every Saturday, Sunday night and others. Because you got to be able to tell your story. Yes. To think that we are in 21 and have less ability to communicate than we did 20 years ago. You tell me, show me Harold Washington, I'll show you a WVON radio. You show me Coleman Young, I'll show you the station in Detroit. Crystal know that. WCHB was the station in Detroit. You show me Amanda Jackson, Andrew Young Mayor, I show you WDAS in Atlanta. We have been silenced, so we can't communicate with each other, and we're not talking about it because we become convinced that we must go to the mainstream rather than the mainstream coming to us. First of all, mainstream. What mainstream? Who defines what is marginal and what's mainstream? When I was growing up in Washington Temple, Operation Breadbag, that was mainstream to me. All the uh, kids I went to school with, they had their cultural event, I had mine. Didn't make one mainstream and one not, it's what you prefer. Some of my friends I went to high school, Whites, blacks, Latinos, some of my friends preferred their art, I preferred mine. Some of them liked the Beatles, I liked James Brown. We weren't mad at each other, we had different tastes. But don't act, to act like if it is not white, it is not mainstream, is subjecting yourself to white supremacy. You have your taste, I have my taste, they're all mainstream. We are, in my opinion, we are in the middle of a situation that if we can rise up and do what we're supposed to do, it can go to changing for the better. Or if we don't, Bishop, it will get worse. What do I mean by that? 
The pandemic, if it did one thing, it exposed what was already existing in terms of the health and education disparities in this country. We've been talking a long time about blacks do not get equal health care. It became apparent with the pandemic. Now the question is, what are we going to do about it? When I hear these folk, I told them when we had the meeting with our Biden, or virtual, or the civil rights leaders, I told them then, we are the only folks saying, let us go back to normal. Don't go back to normal. Normal didn't work for us. You'll never hear me say, I'll be glad we go back to normal. No, I want us to change what was normal. And we're going to have to do it with a real commitment to put the most energy in what is the most neglected. Anybody ever had children? No. You don't love your children equally. You love them based on their needs. Some children need different than other children. You don't give your children the same amount of attention. Some children want to be left alone. Some children need a lot of attention. You don't love them equally, you love them adequately. That a hashtag you. We need adequate attention in the black community. Why? Because we have the disparities in health care. Why? We have the disparities in our educational system. Why? It is because of all that social landscape that gives us a disadvantage. Well, here you all go again. No, we are not like that because we set it up. It was systemically that rendered us that way. You can't, I, I, I was telling some, some students, I spoke at Pace the other week, affirmative action as a government program, which is a moderate version of reparations, because we really must deal with reparations, which we're dealing with right now in the Congress, is that the government must undo what the government did. Y'all act like it was just some custom that blacks couldn't read right. It was against the law. It was not custom we couldn't go to Ivy League school. It was against the law. It was not just white folks down south just didn't get along with us. It was the law we couldn't go where they were. If you put us by law in an inferior position, then when you change the law, you must compensate for those you made suffer under the law. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, my mother from Alabama. When I got to a certain grade and we had to deal with homework, my mother couldn't help me with algebra and geometry. Not because she was ignorant, but she grew up under Jim Crow where she couldn't learn that. You don't blame my mama, you blame those that discriminated against my mama. So I and other blacks had to go to school and compete with students that had the best teachers and the best home training and had parents that could help show them what our parents couldn't. That's why you owe reparations, because it went from generation to generation. We are still recovering from what you did to our great grandparents. <laughs> you go to a doctor, you have an illness. What is the first thing the doctors do? They say, what do you have in your family's medical history? Does cancer run in the family? Does diabetes and anybody on either side, mama, dad? They go through your family history. 
Well, if you're going to deal with the social landscape of America, deal with our family history. I'm just three generations away from slavery. One generation away from Jim Crow. That's my family history. Yet I stand on the stage with you, presidents and governors as an equal, which showed that if you hadn't discriminated against us, not only would we have been equal, we'd have been ahead because we bad enough to come from behind and catch up with you. caught up with you in the race even though you had a mile advantage at the start which means I can run faster than you so here we are in a pandemic on our way out come out with the unemployment numbers yesterday for February Watch this, the only people who unemployment went up was black folks. That's why y'all need black media, because nobody told y'all that. Black unemployment went up 0.7%. We are at 9.9% .9 unemployed. Almost 10% unemployed. Whites, 56 unemployed. So they must be in this relief package how we deal with the disproportionate impact yes. on this pandemic's economic impact on the citizens of the country. It must be addressing the disproportion in our community. Mm -hmm. Why is it disproportionate in our community? Because we are the ones that do the work that are easily expendable. Mm -hmm. That's got to be in the legislation. They're arguing about unemployment. They got to deal with Joe Manson. Let me tell you something. When Manson said that he wouldn't vote for a $15 uh, minimum wage, when Manson said that he wouldn't vote for an extension of the, of the supplement on unemployment insurance at $400, got to come to three. And people were talking about how one man would wield this kind of influence. They marvel when they do it. But we send people, Reverend Dr. English, that uh, do not use their power yeah. the same way. Yeah. It's time for us to quit sending weak folk yeah. in the room with strong folk. Yeah. If you, I don't care what office you're running for, if you don't have enough backbone to stand up, no matter what they say, then you don't need to represent us. You need to have some people that will stand for something and don't care how many attacks they give. I didn't come here for you to pat me on the back. I come to stand for the people nobody stood for. into the church. Reason why we have had some levels of leveling off and not having the progress we need is many of our churches are being led by people that want to be served rather than be of service. I'm going to say that again. You can't have a ministry that's all about worshiping the pastor and the bishop and the archbishop and the whatever title you want rather than deal with how the church is going to be of service. Mr. Taylor and I talk about that all the time. Something wrong when I go to church to preach. And the biggest auxiliary in the church is the pastor's aid committee. And only four folk in the missionary board. Four missionaries and 50 pastor's aides. 
something sick about that. The Reverend, that my, my friend down in Houston, Bishop James Dixon, says the problem is that the church has gone from a battleship to a cruise ship. Church used to be a battleship. Church used to be where we organized and fight the power. But you reduced the church from a cruise ship, from a battleship to a cruise ship. You don't talk about how we gonna go deal with the education. You don't talk about how we gonna deal with unemployment. You're not gonna talk about how we gonna deal with sex trafficking. We're not talking about how we deal with drug addiction. We're not talking about how we dealing with police brutality. We talk about how we going to take a trip to the Bahamas. How we all going on the church sojourn. Let's go for our annual trip to the Holy Land to see where God delivered the children of Israel. Well, that's good if you're going to come back and deliver the children of Africa right here in America. about an exodus? Why are you studying about a liberation movement if you are too cowardly to join one now? God told Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Well, what did God tell you, Reverend? Well, God got longitis now. God's still talking. You're not listening. And you become addicted to trying to be like your oppressor. Let me tell you this. When Moses led the children out of Egypt, out of bondage, I tell you, a lot of a lot of us missed it. When he led them out, and they got to the Red Sea, and God opened up the Red Sea and delivered them dry land in the middle of the Red Sea, and they went over and headed to the Promised Land. They say they wandered in the wilderness 40 years. And they started building trinkets. They started having golden calves. I thought about the golden calves last week when they had a golden Donald Trump statue. Yes. Yes. I'm not making this up. They had the conference of CPAC down in Orlando, Florida last week, and they had a golden statue of Donald Trump. They did all of this worshiping materialism, trinkets, doing the bling bling in the wilderness. And that was addressed in Proverbs. Proverbs 3.31 talks about don't envy the oppressor. Yeah. And what has happened to us, Reverend Bodley, is that we have too many of our preachers that envy the oppressor rather than fight the oppression. So you want the same trinkets you build your appeal of trinkets, golden images. Y'all call it prosperity. And try to make a theology out of wilderness behavior. 
is all it is. We're on our way to the promised land and you done threw up some prosperity trinkets like Dr. King died to get you a new model car. Like Meg Evers died so you can get a mansion out in a neighborhood nobody black can live but you. That people suffered to bring down the walls of Jim Crow so you can be the only Negro in a corporation. And you hustle off of the blood of those that fought to liberate you. God told me the other day, talking about how much I admired and respected Vernon Jordan, who passed this week. But Vernon never stopped fighting in them corporate rooms and never stopped standing up to Bill Clinton and others, speaking truth to power. And one of their uh, guys said to me, a black executive, big corporation, said to me, well, you know, Reverend Al, I, I get along with you because you just ask us to help National Action Network once a year. But well, one of these other guys used to call me four or five times, try to get a donation. And everybody laughed. And I said, ain't funny to me. He said, why you say that? I said, because... The question is not why did he have to call you four or five times. The question is if you, if it hadn't been for him, you wouldn't have been in the corporation. You should have answered the call the first time. How are you bragging about how unresponsive you are to the people that sponsored you in the first place? When you were in the community, living in the housing project. You understood things, but somewhere when we fought and got your ungrateful butt downtown, and you got in the elevator from the lobby up, you got amnesia on the way up. You got a bad case of Negro amnesia. They didn't send for you. We forced you on them. They didn't intend to hire you. We made them hire you. Folks marched. Folks went to jail. Folks left their family to put you in position to take care of your family. And you sitting there behind a glass uh, wall, behind a desk, bragging about what you don't do. Why they go in another room and laugh at you? Because they know the only reason you up there is because of folk like us. You ought to invite me up twice a year just to remind them what we'll do if you ain't up here. <laughs> Prophets are not there to make people come. difference between a prophet and those that just go along to get along is prophets will speak truth to power even if it makes those in charge uncomfortable. Prophets will cry loud and spare not even if it is at the jeopardy to themselves. That's why uh, Women's History Month, I love the story of Esther. Yes. 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 Because Esther, Esther had found favor in the king. Now, y'all need to read that story. There was a guy in the king's court, his main advisor, Haman, who had convinced the king to kill all of the Israelites kill the Jews. There's always a Haman that always wants to afflict the oppressed and that will play to the worst side of those in power. There's always a Haman 
that'll say cut the budget. They don't need that uptown. There's always a hand that says it doesn't matter that blacks are doing three to five times more jail time than whites for the same crime, same criminal background. Just build more jails. There's always a hand that don't care about our daughters being put in situations that they make money off of legalizing their bodies when we should stand up and say you will not use our children that way. There's always a Haman. But Haman is the bad news. The good news is that God has a way of challenging somebody to stand up to the king. And there was, for Haman, there was a Mordecai. And Mordecai kept preaching the truth. If you read the Bible, Mordecai was the stone in the flesh of Haman. Mordecai was the annoyance. You know how they talk about some of us that are active. We get on their nerves. Here we come again. Talk about a George Floyd bill. We just got through with the Eric Garner bill. Now y'all talk about a George Floyd bill. We keep annoying you. Yes. That's absolutely what we gonna do. We gonna annoy you till you get your knee off our neck. We gonna annoy you till you quit choking us to death. Yes. How you going to put your knee on my neck and act like me complaining is annoying you? How you going to put me in a headlock, choking the wind out of me and I tell you I can't breathe? And you tell me, why don't you just shut up and keep the peace? That's why we got that slogan, no justice, no peace. There won't be no quiet as long as you keep doing what you're doing. They don't want peace, they want quiet. The price for peace, Sister Young, is justice. The price for peace is fairness. The price for peace is equality. But if you want to leave things just the way they are, that's just quiet. Just suffer in silence. Just shut up and let things go along. So Mordecai kept disturbing the peace. They wanted to shut him up. They just wanted to do whatever. He just kept going. Because some of us become so obsessed with God in our calling that we couldn't shut up if we wanted to. Some in you. You sing that song in church, something within me. Something in you just make you speak up anyhow. So Mordecai kept on going forward. Finally, it came that sometimes you can be lured by God in a certain way. The king had an eye for Mordecai's cousin Esther. And she was brought into the king's palace. And something about her attracted him as he was used to dealing with all of these women. Rather than Mordecai denounce her, he said, maybe, maybe, you're in there now, you've been raised right. You come out of a liberation family. You come out of a family of annoyance. You come out of a prophetic tradition. Maybe you've come for such a time as this. There's a man in there, Haman, that has plotted the genocide of your people. And you're not in there to be no, no, no beauty queen. You ain't in there to start posing on Instagram. Maybe you've come for such a time as this. I want you to go in and tell the king the plot that Haman has to wipe out your people. 
She said, wait a minute. You know if I do that, I could be punished. I could be killed. We're not supposed to address things like that to the king. We're not supposed to get out of order. That's some of y'all got jobs that you just stay in your little cubicle and don't speak to nothing else because it might risk your little position. You might miss getting the golden key to the bathroom. Whether you got the regular key or the golden key, they're doing the same stuff in the bathroom anyhow. It don't change what the bathroom do. And Esther sent word back. This is what the story of strong black women are. Esther sent back word, well, you know, it may affect my career. It may affect my social standing. It may affect my position in the palace. No, I'll be honest. It may even cost my life. All I want y'all to do is fast and pray for me three days. That go back to a spiritual connection. That's why Creole English, we got to have folk that got some spiritual power in these positions because you can't take some stands by yourself. You can't risk some things by yourself. Some stands you've got to reach inside and have the internal strength to say not by might or by power, but by his will. I can do it because I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. I can't do this by myself. She said fast three days and pray three days. And she said, I fasted now, I prayed, I made one decision that separated me from the other beautiful women in the palace. I made up my mind, I'm going to do this. And if I perish, let me perish. But I'm going to see the king. You are not prophetic till you get to the I don't mind perishing side. Until you get to where you throw it on the line. Till you get where you say, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I can lose it all. But I'm going to stand up anyhow. God can't catch you until you're willing to fall. I can't go there. That's jumping off a cliff. But I got enough faith. Yeah. Yeah. that if I jump off a cliff for God yeah. that I'm jumping in his arms because he won't let me fall some of y'all are too careful to be useful some that a hashtag too useful some of y'all are too careful to be useful why do we remember Women's History Month Rosa Parks? Because she wasn't that careful. Why do we remember Fannie Lou Hamer? Because she wasn't that careful. Why do we remember Gloria Richardson, Shirley Chisholm? Because they wasn't that careful. They were more useful than they were careful. Reason why nobody remembers you and will remember you is you was careful, but you weren't useful. You lived all right, but you were so careful that your life didn't affect nobody but you. I tell folk all the time that I'm very selective now about preaching funerals. I don't preach everybody's funeral no more. When I was a younger preacher, I grab I need you to do my cousin's funeral. I didn't know your cousin, but I preach. My great aunt died. Mississippi, when you go down and preach a few, I never heard of her, but I'll go. I done got selected now. Because most folk shouldn't even have a funeral. I want y'all to hear me now. Most folk should go straight from the ball to the cemetery. Because most folk ain't done nothing 
for us to talk about. I, I remember I told this story. I told this story many times. I remember the night that I did the eulogy at Michael Jackson's burial. Spoke at the big moral service and then I spoke at the at the burial. And I remember we put Michael in the mausoleum, King of Pop, biggest artist of, of that time. And when we was coming out of the crib area, one of the biggest entertainers at that time. And now, stop me, said Reverend Al, I said, yeah. He said, I really was moved by that eulogy. I said, well, thank you. He said, no, 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 it really got to me. I said, well, thank you. He said, I just want to say to you, if, if I go first, I want you to preach my funeral. And I looked at him and said, well, you got to give me something to work with. <laughs> That's why I stopped doing a lot of funerals, because I got tired, Crystal, of getting up, lying, and hallucinating over somebody's body. I mean, you sit up in the pastor's study trying to make up stuff <laughs> about somebody ain't done nothing. Got them a nice house. Who cares? It'll be on the market next week. Somebody else will move in that house and never even know you were there. Got you a nice car. We'll ride all over Highway 5 in your car. Change the registration when we get ready. And big wardrobe. Well, we'll see what we can fit. The rest will go to the charity. The only thing that will matter two minutes after you die is what you've done for more than yourself. <laughs> Martin Luther King didn't have the biggest church in Atlanta. There was churches bigger than him. He didn't leave a lot of money. $5,000 in the bank. They had to raise money to help with his family. But he changed this country from the back of the bus to the front of the city hall, all the way to the White House. And now when you go to Washington, D.C. and the plane circle, Q English, and they go around getting ready to land, you look over and see the Washington Monument and then the Jefferson Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. And then you see on the banks of the Potomac River a memorial to Martin Luther King. Every third Monday of every year, the schools and the courts are closed to celebrate a black preacher that didn't make it off the size of his church, but he stood for something. Yeah. I remember when I was a teenager, I let you go. There was a short diminutive woman in Brooklyn, Shirley Chisholm. I was youth director of her campaign for president. Men talked about her in the most unsavory way. Black men, black politicians, blacks in office refused to support her. And I was shocked. I'd grown up a boy preacher looking up to some of these men. I was shocked to be in the room the way they would talk about it. But Shirley said, I'm unbought and I'm unbossed. If y'all ain't got a seat for me at the table, I'll bring me a folding chair. But y'all gonna respect me. Shirley ran in 72, was elected to Congress in 68. There have been a whole lot of folk elected since Shirley. Some black women, some black men. But the reason why half a century later we remember Shirley Chisholm because she stood for something. Somewhere I read that if I be lifted up, not if you lift your name, not if you get your comfort. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto thee. I'll give you eternal life. Your life and your name will live beyond your breath that's in your body. If you just lift me up. But he that findeth himself, 
you ego maniacal, narcissistic wow. folk. Ye that find yourself shall lose it. But he that loses himself for my sake shall find it. I found myself joining a movement bigger than me. Come out of broken home, daddy left when I was 10, left with my stepsister. I lost myself in saying I am somebody. I lost myself in saying no justice, no peace. I lost myself fighting for Yusef Hawkins, fighting for Michael Griffin. I lost myself. I missed my mega church. I missed my Cadillac. I lost myself standing up for the rejected. I missed my house in the suburbs, but I found myself standing up, crying loud, bearing not. Reverend, how'd you make it? My soul. I'll tell you how I made it. Storms in life keep on raging. Sometimes, even the day is hard to tell the night from the day. But I keep my eyes on the prize. Because my soul is anchored in the law. Y'all are watching the sails on my boat. The winds can blow the sails, but the wind don't blow the anchor. My soul, my soul, my soul is anchored in the law. Though the storms keep on breaking in my life And sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day Still that hope that lies within is reassured as I keep my eyes upon the distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. Oh, 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 oh,
activities on television, but never joined National Action Network, never became an active member, joined one of our committees, worked with us in whatever capacity you can or want to. This can be your home for fighting for justice. If you're here today and never joined, just come down to me now and we'll arrange to sign you up right now to be a part of this justice family. Come on. Everybody sing. Come on, everybody sing. Everybody singing. Yeah, singing like you mean. All right, everybody now. Everybody singing. Take our offering, taking our new members, and let you go. Our women's exerted did a good job kicking off. Women's History Month, the color today was blue. I want everybody to give to the best of their ability. Glad to have our National College and Youth Director with us, Minister yeah. Talik McMillan. Yeah. I want everybody to give to the best of their ability. And uh, I thank uh, Goldie. I heard you that uh, Krista said you told her to wear in blue today. And uh, everybody, all our women with blue. My grandson, he don't know how to text yet. He knows how to baby tick. So me and him talk on baby tick. His mother and aunt and grandmother don't know we got our own thing. So he baby ticked me earlier this morning and said, they got a blue thing going on around here. So wear your blue tie. Uh, he looking at me like you weren't supposed to tell that. All right, I need about 10 people, about 10 people or more to give me $100. Give $100, National Action Network this morning. 10 people. Got an anonymous $100. Guardians, $100. Winston Gilchrist, $100. Lloyd Williams, $100. Brother William, Brother Wayne, $100. Cork Carrie Wass of the Central, exonerated Central Park. $100. Membership, $210. Sabuni from Mount Vernon, $100. Pastor Bartley from New Jersey Tech, $100. Women's Auxiliary, $100. All right, bring me, come on, Alvin Ponder. I heard you on the radio this morning. You know I want my 100 Alvin Ponder, $100. Bishop Taylor, $100. Crystal McCray, one. Crystal, uh, Crystal. McGuire. No, I, before I get to McGuire, I was giving a, a, a first name. 
But anyway, Mrs. McGuire, I'll go there. Crystal uh, McGuire, $100. Crystal McCray McGuire. That's what I was trying to say, $100. All right, give me some 50s, 50s, 50s. Give me some 50s, give me some 50s. My schoolmate, we went to junior high school together. Brother David, one hundred dollars. The sister Michelle, fifty dollars. Reverend Reggie Backus, fifty dollars. Michelle gave a hundred. All right. Reverend Reggie Backus in the house. Reverend Carolyn, fifty dollars. Twenties, 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 twenties. Come on. Hello. All right. All right. Brother Chris, giving fifty dollars. Chris, that's one. Now everybody, whatever you have, one dollar. Ten dollars, five dollars, whatever you have. At Jacob Reese in Queensbridge, we arranged to have a thousand first shots for residents of Queensbridge. We only have Rodney, 200 people as of two hours ago. So we have 800 shots left. So we need to spread that word, amplify that message. All right, we need to amplify that and get the word out. Let us act accordingly. Now again, Again, there are some that are hesitant about the shots, but we need it accessible to everybody. I tell some of my friends that say they don't want to take the shot because of history, good. We want it available to everybody. I took the shot, I'm going to take the second shot. Others can make up their mind, but don't. As, as I'm in my mid-60s. I'm too old to be arguing with you about my arm. I look like I'm crazy. Stand up somewhere arguing with you at my age about what I'm going to do with my arm. Now, if you want to keep your arm without a shot, that's your arm. But I believe uh, when, when they showed me Dr. Kizzy Carver, a black woman, helped make the vaccine, and I see all these whites in line getting the vaccine. I do not believe that all these whites are out there trying to guinea pig me. Now you can believe that if that's what you want to believe. Half a million people dead, and you sitting up with a theory that somebody wrote you 
on the internet that you don't even know who they are. Doctor who? They went to what university? So you do that. But I'm gonna fight to get the access. I ain't tell nobody what to do, but I'm gonna give them the ability to do it. But as for me, I got the shot. And anybody gonna be around me in my house gonna get shot or get moved. They ain't got to get the shot. But they can visit me when the storm has passed over. That's, that's why they make Zoom. That's why they make Zoom. Ashley taught me how to Zoom. I got one brother, brother called me Gassy. I don't believe in a mask. Good. Zoom me. <laughs> we ain't got to break up family. Just don't talk in person. Just get on the Zoom. When I call your name, come forth. Vincent Kwame Afe Capri Ali Arnold and Carl A. Hill. Give them a hand as they come. Let me welcome you to the National Action Network family. We need you, we want you, we want your ideas, we want your input, we want your energy to be part of our family. We thank you for stepping forth, and right now you are officially members of the National Action Network. Face the audience and welcome them to the family. Welcome them to the family. Welcome them to the family. All right. They will give you orientation so you can work with one of our committees or you may have an idea that we can start with you. All right, let everybody stand. I'm going to dismiss those that want to come up and fist bump with me or one of the speakers is welcome to do so. Fist bump. Don't try to hug. Don't try to get in a meeting. Don't try to tell me I need to see you. This is fist bump time. If you are not scheduled for a meeting, that means you're not meeting with me because you'll be on the schedule. So I'm talking about can I see you. No, we do that in advance. I'm telling you that now. If you're not on the schedule, you can't meet with me today. That's how you get on the schedule. But not, that's why we have staff. Yeah. Anybody need to see someone about a problem, that's what staff is here for. Absolutely. That's why we hire staff. For some folks act like the only one can do something is me. No, I need staff to do that. Mm -hmm. All right? Amen. So I'm trying to make their job easy by explaining it to you. We want to help everybody. That's why we got staff set up to do that. That's yeah. what we're here for, yeah. is that we want to hear what you need if you have needs. Everybody take stand to your feet. Oh, man. Zane Grace. I'll see the sound that's made. After me, we're an African people. Robbed of our name, our language, our family, our self-respect. But we shall rise, never to fall again. Of you, mighty race, we can accomplish what we will. No justice, no peace, no justice. No peace, no justice, no peace. Fist bump with the one you're standing next to. Fist bump with me before you leave.